Okay, on this segment of Conversations with Beth, this is from last month, so in April, and my friend Beth shared some really awesome insight about the Mount Tambora eruption and how it changed the earth and played a huge role in the gathering of Israel all over the world. It's, it's not really in any particular order. I did lose a couple parts of the recordings, but I think what I have gets the point across. But there's a lot of things she shared that I was not aware of, and it was new to me. And because I thought it was so fascinating, I thought surely somebody out there would find it just as fascinating, if not even more so. And towards the end of the video, it switches over to another one of our friends. She shared some really interesting insight in relation to the same conversation. And so I got her permission to add that in this video. And anyways, these are just their own personal thoughts. And I thought I would just share with anybody out there who wants to join in the conversation or share any additional perspective. Um, yeah, these are the things that we sometimes talk about every now and then. And um, for the most part, we talk a lot about just our kids and our families and just life in general, you know, being parents. And once in a while, somebody will strike up a conversation and share something really fascinating, like what you're about to listen to. <laughs> so anyways, I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I'm going to turn the conversation over to Beth. Okay, so um, I thought this was super interesting. I came across one more article um, that this is still being talked about even in 2022. This article right here that I'm posting is actually from this year, from 2022. And it's diving into... Um, what they're still finding as they're researching the explosion of Mount Timber, like what a big deal it was. And I thought it was really interesting that it noted, it said like, here are the really big things that it kind of brought into the world. Like that was kind of really interesting that resulted from this. And it notes the bicycle basically came from it, the book Frankenstein. And the third thing that this random article from the farmer's almanac wanted to point out that it caused a bunch of people from Vermont to move, including the family of Joseph Smith. This move may have made possible the publication of the Book of Mormon and the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, I thought that was so cool, you guys, like just to see us mentioned in not a rude way, <laughs> you know, but like that has even gained significance with the Mount Tempura. Like that is now associated with the Mount Tempura um, explosion, like officially the world sees it that way, 2022. I thought that was amazing. Also, um, in Doctrine and Covenants, when the Lord is describing um, what will happen before his return, it again describes this type of thing, all the things that happen with a volcanic explosion. Before that great day shall come, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall be turned to blood, the stars shall fall from the sky, um, shall be greater signs in the heaven and in the earth beneath, and there shall be a great hailstorm sent forth to destroy the crops of the earth. And in multiple different articles I read, hailstorms came after these volcanic volcanic explosions, um, taking out crops. Um, there's one I put in here um, that happened. It was recorded in Connecticut. Um, no, in Massachusetts. The entire corn crop, except the fields nearby, um, ponds where the ocean failed, hailstones beat the blossoms off all the fruit trees. So they wouldn't even get fruit that year. And then they talked about there was tons of hailstorms around in Indonesia that took out their crops as well, which is interesting because you don't usually get hailstorms in some place like Indonesia. Um, then, and like in the earlier articles, I wasn't finding anything saying the sun was blocked out for very long, only knowing it would be because that's what happened when these other volcanic explosions happened like a thousand years earlier, right? It said um, there's poetry written about it. Um, and then they quote other like American magazines that came out at the time. The sun's rays seemed to be destitute of heat throughout the summer. All nature was clad in a sable hue. Um, during the entire season, the sun arose each morning as though in a cloud of smoke, red and rayless, shedding little light or warmth and setting at night as behind a, clip, a thick cloud of vapor, leaving it hardly a trace of it having passed over the face of the earth. So there's, there's our like evidences coming out that yes, these things did happen. There was crop damage, um, entire lakes were frozen over in the middle of July. Uh, grain prices soared. They quadrupled at the time. Famine, riots, arson, and looting occurred in many European cities. China suffered massive crop failures, disastrous floods. Um, in India, they had a cholera outbreak from the river. Oh, there was a cholera outbreak from the river Ganges all the way up to Moscow. So this like affected the entire northern hemisphere. 
the other thing, um, and I think I talked about this, but it talks about, um, you know, in China, they talked about with the one that happened a thousand years ago that they couldn't see the stars for three months because of that, that um, volcanic ash that was in the air. And that's one of the things it talks about, that the stars seem to fall from the heavens. Like you can't see them anymore. And um, the here's interesting. The heaven departed as a scroll and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And when these volcanic explosions happen, they literally will blow the top right off um, the mountain. And this one, like, there's a couple pictures of this one that I've put with Mount Timbera. Anyway, I just thought, I don't know, I've just, I guess I've just heard lots of talk of people wondering, like, well, what was that big earthquake that Revolution 6 talks about? Like, you never hear of some big earthquake. What if it's talking about this Mount Timbera explosion that would have been an earthquake that would have caused it caused all these other things and it drew worldwide attention and i think what's really interesting is it's drawing worldwide attention now like they didn't know that's what caused it back at the time because they didn't have like the telegraph out there in the boonies of indonesia they had you know little fishing villages and it took a really long time for the news of that explosion to reach the rest of the world so it's like now in our time that the pieces are being put together that they're realizing that year without a summer was because of this volcanic explosion and all these different events can be traced back to that volcanic explosion. And in our saints book, it starts with that. It starts with that explosion. Like it's like even all the members of the church have now been educated on the name of that volcano and that that was a big deal and helped lead to the restoration. And now here it is 2022 and publications outside of our church are even noting the significance of that explosion and bringing about our church. So I just, I don't know, like, what if that is what it's talking about? It just seems um, really amazing to me, especially coming on such a significant day, too, you know? That seems significant to me. So anyway, and I, I do feel like this totally matches descriptions of what would come preceding the Savior's return, right? And around that time period. And I know that's something we've talked about before, Um Anyway, but it's, it is kind of interesting to know, as I've looked at each of these, that there's been patterns with each of it and how it affected the world. And one thing I've seen noted twice now with the 537 one and this one is that the earth gave abundant fruit beforehand. So like in the 537 one, they noted that they had gotten lots of extra fruit on the trees the year before that. Um, happened and they had crop failure everywhere and that a lot of people had already stored up and canned food because you know they had ancient canning methods and stuff and with this one especially when they're talking about vermont and all the people that left there they said it destroyed seven years of amazing growth vermont had seen because vermont was doing really well for seven years and i was like that's the joseph needs of story that's the seven years of plenty before the famine hits so anyway i thought that was really interesting um especially just looking at our time and our day and um, talking a lot about preparation lately. And um, yeah, like I feel like there's things we can learn from. Like the Lord doesn't just completely surprise us, but he allows us to learn from the past and the people of the past and how they handled things. And um, this volcanic explosion stuff has happened already a few different times um, and affected the world and affected great change in the world. That's the other thing, like huge changes took place when that happened. Um, as far as like people moving and um, new leadership in countries, old leadership being done away with. And what I'm seeing a pattern of especially is when there's corrupt leaders or a corrupt city that oftentimes the people, as they go hungry, they will revolt against those leaders and they will get rid of them. And sometimes they'll even get rid of the religious beliefs that they have at the time because they're like, well, this didn't help us. <laughs> and they become open to new religions like that's when the muslim religion arose it was right after a volcanic explosion that's when we had the great um, revival happen in north america and throughout the world was after the tempura explosion because people were were soul searching people like the reality of god um, was very real to them and they knew that they needed him and they were open to um, a religious revival and we had the church rise up during that time. So I do think it's really interesting and quite probable we'll see that right before a millennial time because it seems to be one of the quickest ways the Lord can affect change in the world. <laughs> it comes very quickly after an explosion like that. And um, 
is able to create the kind of humbling circumstances throughout the entire world that is sometimes needed to get rid of old corrupted leadership and to open people's hearts to uh, to faith to a new faith so anyway very cool i thought very cool um, what it can maybe teach us about things coming and help us prepare for that and help us to i don't know i just i love seeing how things fit together so i wanted to share with you guys um i guess because I am still researching and looking at this. So um, that stuff I shared yesterday about the volcano that went off in 537, it meant everything that's prophesied about in Revelation 6, except that it didn't come during the sixth seal. Like the fifth seal would have been, you know, time of Christ through about 1000 AD. And so I'm like, what? How come, like, it just matches so perfectly with what everything that talks about right there is prophesied about with um, the earthquake um, like it's a volcanic eruption is what it's describing and all the aftermath. I was like, well, so the next thousand years, right? During the sixth seal. So I was looking through that and, um, like not finding anything that matched. And then I thought, well, the volcanic eruption is what described T, T, but Revelation six, except that it didn't come during the sixth seal. Like the fifth seal would have been, you know, time of Christ through about 1000 AD. And so I'm like, well, how come, like, it just matches so perfectly with what everything that talks about right there is prophesied about with um, the earthquake, um, like it's a volcanic eruption is what it's describing and all the aftermath. So then I was like, well, something like that happened during the next thousand years, right? During the sixth seal. So I was looking through that and, um, like not finding anything that matched. And then I thought, well, the volcanic eruption is what described everything and met everything to a T. Then was it a volcanic eruption um, that happened during that sixth seal time period that is described as an earthquake here in the scriptures? Because earthquakes completely accompany volcanic eruptions and it shakes the earth really bad and everything. I mean, it would have been seen as the same thing. So when I looked at that, um, it took me to Mount Tempura, Tempura, the one that went off and caused the year without a summer and caused the Smith family to move from Vermont over to Palmyra, right? So it's like, it's how our saints books start is with that big eruption. So anyway, I started looking into that and some of the stuff I found was that it was 10 times stronger than the volcano that went off back in 576. And it's actually listed as the biggest recorded volcano to ever go off in history. It killed over 70,000 people. Um, it thrust the world into winter. There's uh, poetry written about how it blocked out the sun. Um, so like all the things that we see accompanying these huge blasts, the volcanic blasts, like the one we saw in 576 that I talked about, those are the same things that accompanied Mount Tempura when it, when it went off. And um, anyway, there's some really fascinating articles about that, how it affected everything. You know, plants stopped growing. It caused it caused a food shortage, which led to disease, which led to huge migrations of people heading westward. Usually, um, they cut the states of Indiana and Illinois for people filled them, and they became states in the years right after, because everybody was leaving Virginia, or Vermont and New England and all those places, trying to find, you know, like a place where they could grow food. Basically, anyway, it led to all. It led to. Um, people revolting and not being happy with their leaders and um, huge changes throughout the world. Again, so it basically mirrored that other volcano. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting. So um, I saw something that said uh, it went off on the 10th of April, 1815. And I'm like, oh, April, okay, that's usually when Passover happens. So let me check the calendar. And um, sure enough, the 10th of April, when I check the calendar, and I'll post it here below, is is called Rosh Ch Chedesh. Nissan, Rosh Chedesh, something like that. But anyway, it's the celebration of the first of the year, first of Nissan, which is like the new year, the new calendar year. Now, I think it's interesting because Jews today don't celebrate that as the new year. They celebrate Rosh Hashanah in the fall as the new year. But when Moses received the calendar, when it was revealed to him, the calendar back when he was in Egypt trying to free the people, the Lord told him when one Nissan would be, and that would be the first day on the calendar. And he was also told there would be like a great sign in the heavens. And when the people saw the sign in the heavens, which they think, like historians today think was a solar eclipse because of how it was described, when the people saw the sign in the heavens on one Nisan, all the people of Israel rejoiced because they knew it was a sign that they were about to be delivered from Pharaoh. 
And then sure enough, like 14, 15 days later, they had Passover and then they were, they were free and they got to go. So that date is really significant because we have it coming up on April 8th of 2024 when um, there's another solar eclipse. And I just think that's really symbolic that a solar eclipse is happening on the exact same Jewish holy day or very start, you know, that like literally the very first sign and the very first calendar given to the Israelites. I think it's super symbolic. So I thought, oh my goodness, here I am looking at an 1815 Hebrew calendar. And it says that the start of that year was also on the 10th of April is when their celebrations began for one Nisan. So literally Mount Tempura went off on that very significant day. And I think it's so symbolic because when the sign was given, the sun was blocked out back for the Hebrews when they were slaves. On that day, on one Nisan, they knew it was a sign that they were about to be delivered, right? They were about to be delivered out of Babylon, away from Pharaoh. And here we had Mount Tempura go off on the exact same day on one Nisan at the celebration of that. And literally five years later, literally, because I'll tell you how literally in just a minute, literally five years later is when the first vision happened. Meaning this too was a sign that the Israelites were about to be delivered. A spiritual deliverance was coming. I just, you guys, I just blew my mind. That's so cool. I love how like the Lord works. Like he gives these signs and these wonders and he marks these holy days and these holy times. And we often don't know they're happening when they're happening, but afterwards we can look back and we can know the Lord knew all along what was coming and he marks it on his calendar. So on when one day sun was being celebrated, although most Jews throughout the world no longer celebrate that there's one sect of Jews that still do. And they actually are in New York city. So I think that's really interesting. And I've, I actually even had the thought, I wonder if they don't celebrate it because I wonder if it's when uh, the savior was born. Because he was born, you know, April 6th. Um, he was born in that springtime. And I was like, ooh, I wonder if it's like, if that fell on the calendar when the Savior would have been born somewhere in there. And maybe that's one of the reasons Jews today don't celebrate it anymore. Because they used to. They used to a lot. Maybe they're like, they don't want to associate it with him. So anyway, um, what's really interesting is then I thought, well, when did the first... Um, when did the first vision happen? And I went and looked that up. I believe it was the first vision. Um, also on one Nissan, like the same date. Let me go double check on that. I took screenshots of each of it to make sure I was getting it right. Anyway, I just think it's really incredible. Like the Lord has a pattern to things. And I think it's really interesting that four different times now that start of his calendar year has, there's been some kind of sign um, that was a big deal. So we have, we have, it was assigned to the Israelites. Their deliverance was near. It happened right before Passover. And then that one in 537, which I think marked the start of the great apostasy. Like it, it was, a, it symbolized, okay, the time of darkness has come. That one also happened. I, I would highly, I would not be surprised. Let's just say that if it happened on one Nisan, because it's noted in um, Jewish records that the Sunday before Sabbath, that's when the ashes hit and the sun was blackened out. And that instead of that week of Passover being a rejoicing time, everybody was filled with anxiety and fear instead. So I wouldn't be surprised if the actual volcano went off on one day sun, the ashes hit Jewish people on the Sabbath before, before Passover. Anyway, so that volcanic eruption in 537 happened around one day sun. Mount Timbura, which is really significant to the restoration, happened on one Nisan. And then literally five years later, the um, first vision, which happened March 26th, is what they figured out. There's a great video out there on that, how they figured that out. But it was on the Sabbath before Passover, if I remember right. I now I have to go look. Anyway, and we have this April 8th one coming up too, um, of a solar eclipse. And I just think we need to pay attention because there's a pattern to these things and there's you know, um, amazing miracles that have followed a lot of these things. So anyway, I thought it was fascinating and really cool. Um, and it really made me wonder because if Mount Timbura was 10 times worse than, um, uh, Krakow, it sounds like Kraken. So I just keep thinking Mount Kraken, <laughs> but literally these volcanoes blew their tops off and, um, like like miles and miles into the air and sulfuric gas filled everywhere. I mean, it was crazy. And some of the volcanic eruptions were so powerful that it literally split 
um, mountain sites in half, like mountain ranges in half, not just one mountain, but like cause like a six mile divide to go right down a mountain range and split it in half. And that's one of the things they talk about is, is the revelation talks about, um, like mountains being removed and all that stuff. So anyway, I just thought that was really fascinating. Um, I thought that was really fascinating that when it talks about there's a large earthquake, that that could be thought like volcanic activity, like a huge volcano going off because everything that follows it is describing what happens after a volcano goes off in the world and earthquakes always accompany that. So anyway, Oh, Oh, this was the other one. This was it. I was like, what was the other one that happened on one Nissan? The other thing that happened on one Nissan was April 6th, 2000, when the Palmyra temple was dedicated. There's a lot of thought on that, of that being the opening of the seventh seal. So I just think that's really interesting that that particular day was also a very significant day because it was one Nissan as well. So here's something interesting that came to mind. Um, so I was looking at what caused some of the great migrations to America um, that we've had. And two came to mind, the great German migration of 1847 and then the Irish potato famine. And I thought it was really interesting. Those were around the same years because the Irish potato famine hit in um, September, by the way. These things like always hit around Rosh Hashanah. They just do. But it hit in September of 1845. And... Um, a million, over a million people died of the famine and more millions ended up fleeing to America um, to try and survive, right? And then in 1847, um, the the different duchies and, and kingdoms that now make up Germany got into a big war. Prussia got into a big like civil war and all the men were being recruited to fight. And so millions upon millions of Germans started coming to America to escape that, to escape war. And so I just thought, boy, that's so interesting that we had these huge migrations within a few years of each other of two groups of people that are known to be of um, Israelite blood, specifically of Ephraim, right? We have a lot of Ephraim and Judah in those two groups. And um, I mean, like 1847, that is just, so I used to, the department I was in when I researched with Ancestry was the German department. And when someone says they have German ancestors, they went researched, we would be like, oh, okay, did they come in the 1700s or did they come in 1847? Because <laughs> it's such like a landmark date for the Germans to come. So anybody that came earlier than that tended to be like the Anabaptist group, like the Amish, that kind of stuff, you know. But the, the, the fallout from that war in Germany was so huge that millions started coming 1847 and 1848. Uh, just this huge influx of migration. That's when my German ancestors came was 1847. It's just standard. <laughs> like I can just ask people when they're like, oh, I had German ancestors. And I'll be like, oh, did they come in 1847? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> like, How'd you know? But that's just the year that they started all coming. So anyway, I was thinking about this. And I think it's really interesting that it was only about seven years earlier than that. I need to look up the exact date. But Joseph and Hiram as dual prophets, because Hiram was or, ordained to be a dual prophet with Joseph. Um, they were both prophets, with Joseph being the acting president of the church. Um, Susan Eason Black talks about this. The Stoddards have an entire video about this. But they issued together a call to start gathering Israel. And it was an official proclamation of the church. It's one of like the biggest and most significant and important proclamations um, that has been issued. And it was three and a half years exactly from their death. So their death was in June, 1844. So this proclamation was either in like the very end of September, 1840, or in the very beginning of 1841. I'm not sure which. I'd have to look up what the exact date is. Um, but the number of days was like exactly 1260 or 12, whatever the number of days it prophesies about in the book of Revelations the time period before the prophets were killed, the two prophets, it's that exact time period from when they issued the call to gather Israel. So what's really interesting about that is that call was issued in early 1840s. And immediately all those saints that were trying to establish the church in the British Isles, that was their call to gather. And Sarah has talked about her dad was a, um, a big history guy. Sarah, you'll have to clarify that he was, um, her parents were really involved with, with some church history stuff. And one thing she talked about is that they had told her, her dad had told her, so I'll clarify if I'm telling this wrong, um, that that call was issued, but even before that call was issued, people started to feel the spirit telling them to start gathering. And their leaders would be like, hold on, hold on, like we're not, but like let's, we need to establish the church here. And they're like, but I feel the call to go, like to go and join the saints in Nauvoo. And so even before that official declaration came out, people were starting to already feel the pull to do that. Well, anyway, but once that was official, 
you know, then we have all those saints coming from England and coming right to Nauvoo and from Wales and all that stuff. We have that huge migration. So it was like the church, the saints migrated first when that call came. But I, I just, it just occurred to me today how fascinating and interesting it is that within five to seven years of that call, all of a sudden, other groups of Israel and Ephraim started to also come here to the promised land, back to their land of inheritance, um, which is this is the land of inheritance for the descendants of Joseph. And that's when we get millions of people coming from Germany in 1847 and millions of people coming from Ireland in the 1840s um, through the early 1850s because of that potato famine. And I was just like, oh my goodness. Like, even though that proclamation and that call, we've always thought of it as for the saints only, the Lord still called his people home. And he literally has that scripture that says, like, I will call you through, you know, like thunderings and lightnings and torments to gather you to like to call you to repentance um, if you do not hear the voice of my servants. And literally the voice of the servants had spoken and issued his call. And those that heeded that right away had an easier time coming than those that waited until war and famine pushed them to come. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I just thought, okay, well, that's really fascinating. So look at our day and our time. And how long has President Nelson been prophet? Like around five years, somewhere in there? Um, four years, six years, somewhere in there? And look at what has been his, like, clarion call. One, getting the temples built. But two, he has constantly talked about, this is the last push to gather Israel. This is our time to gather Israel. It's the greatest work we can be involved in. We need to be doing family history. We need to be doing missionary work. Our youth, this is their call. This is the greatest. He constantly talks about that, about this big push to gather Israel. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, here we have another prophet making the call. It's time to gather. It's time to gather. And yes, that's, I mean, I think that the focus has been a spiritual gathering, right? But I think it's very interesting that within five years of his calling this out, that there's now starting to be a physical gathering happening that the Lord is using through natural means, um, you know, like war, famine, these kind of things to bring people here. Um, anyway, I just, I think that's fascinating, and I think it's fascinating what we might see over the next few years as he continues to gather um, people to places they need to be. And I think it's so interesting that right before all this happened, um, President Nelson spoke to the European people. I mean, it was literally like a week or two before all this started happening with Ukraine, and he told them that the Lord had placed them specifically in Europe for this day and this time because of the because of the role they needed to play in helping gather Israel in that area of the world. Um, and now there's literally 4 million displaced Ukrainians looking for homes in Europe and in a very humble state ready to receive that, that gospel, to receive that hope. So anyway, um, yeah, just fascinated and amazed by the pattern and that connection today to see that the Lord also helped gather Israel once that call was made, um, that a literal gathering started taking place to this to this country. So, anyway. I thought this was interesting, so I was like, when did the Nicene Creed come out? Because, you know, that's the creed that where they decided to vote and decided to change the doctrine and make it that Heavenly Father, Christ, and Holy Ghost are all one person. So that's where the Trinity doctrine came about, right? And I was like, okay, so when did that happen? Because that's definitely part of ushering the world into apostasy, right? And um, so that was like in the 300s. But um, I thought it was interesting to note that it was um, added to a revised about 50 years later in Constantinople, which I guess was, if I remember right, the capital of the like Holy Roman Empire, um, because that was like one of the, the very first places hit with the bubonic plague when that broke out. Um, and I thought it was interesting. They noted this was the first time anyone had seen the plague. Like it came back a couple other times. It came back in, uh, I think the 1300s as well throughout Europe. But this was like the first time for it to hit that particular disease. And Nobody had ever seen it before. It was awful. But I thought it was interesting. One of the biggest places hit was Constantinople, um, which, you know, was one of the places that was ushering in this apostasy as fast as they could. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, that was the place. Constantinople was the place where they were having to bury 15,000 people a day. And when they got up to 250,000 deaths, they just stopped counting because it was just so much. They couldn't keep up with it. 
and it, I, if I remember right, it like really weakened. Like that's when Constantinople like died out as the capital. So anyway, kind of interesting. Just interesting to see how these things piece together and play together. Oh, I forgot to note, but I noted it here in my notes that I have above that the other thing it did, like it literally changed, it just changed everything around the world. And the other place it changed was um, the city of Teotihuacan, like down in Mexico, you know, like I think that's what either the Aztecs or the Mayans, I get those two confused. But um, it caused like a great drought to happen there. And um, it ended up causing the people ended up uprising against the leaders and storming the temple, that great Teotihuacan temple, and setting it on fire and basically like getting rid of the, the kings and the leaders and all that stuff, um, which again goes back to the prophecy about the basically leaders throughout the world stepping down, changing, um, like total new change came. So it's really interesting because it's around that time archaeologically in North America with the North American Indians, there's, so there's the Hopewell time period, and then they got, like, they just suddenly disappeared around 400, 450 AD, and then um, a new period starts where people were, like, trying to copy the methods of the Hopewell people because they were such a great civilization. They couldn't quite get it there, so they just kind of copied a lot of things that they had done. The archaeologists archaeologists can tell a huge difference between the two societies. Um, for one, um, the Hopewell had, like, a great network of cities where it was like a like a nation, like a group of people united by a cultural and religious beliefs. Whereas um, once they just were suddenly gone, um, they call it the Mississippian time period started, and it's right around this time period too. Um, so it's really interesting. And and I wonder, because it was during that time like that I think the Aztec people came up and they took over a ton of the tribes of the southern United States and made them into slaves. And that's when they built, um, they started building structures that looked like the temples down in Mexico, but they're making them out of dirt and they're making the slaves build them. Anyway, and there's one today in, I think it's called Coweta, Georgia. And then there's one in, um, oh, what's it called? It's in St. Louis. It's the really big one. I can't remember what it is right now. I was just talking to someone about this. They were like, oh, I'm going to go see it. And anyway, so it's really interesting. And now, now I'm wondering if that's why the people came up and took over um, in the southern United States, all those people. Maybe it coincided with this as well. So anyway, um, pretty interesting, pretty interesting. Now, this part of interesting is also the time of year it happened because usually the judgments of God are things that are calling his people to repentance or huge signs and wonders. They come around either the Passover time or like um, Rosh Hashanah time. So like, you know, like around general conference times, really. And so it's really interesting to note that this all happened in late March of that year. I said from the 24th of March and this year till the 24th of June and the following year 15 is when this all happened. Um, here's someone else from Cesare. Uh During this year, a most dreadful portent took place, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear. So people could tell this wasn't an eclipse, but something was going on because the sun was blocked out. They could see it was there, but like it wasn't shining its light anymore which is so symbolic it's so symbolic of the savior during the apostasy like he was there he was there for his people but like his light could not shine in its fullness anymore because the priesthood was no longer in the earth his church was no longer there like he could not be there in his fullness which is it's so symbolic here's another one the sun became dim for nearly the whole year and the fruits were killed at an unseasonable time and then here's someone from Casadon. Wherever Casadocerius, since the world is not governed by chance but by a divine ruler who does not change his purpose at random, men are alarmed and naturally alarmed at the extraordinary signs of the heavens, and ask with anxious hearts what events these may portend. The sun, first of stars, seems to have lost his his wonted light and appears of a bluish color, and we marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, 
and to feel the mighty vigor of the heat wasted into feebleness and the phenomena which accompany a tra transitory eclipse prolonged throughout a whole year. The moon too, even when her orb is full, is empty of her natural splendor. Strange has been the course of the year thus far, and we have had a winter without storms, a spring without mildness, and a summer without heat. Whence we can look for a harvest since the months which should have been maturing the corn have been chilled by the north wind. How can the blade open and if rain, the mother of all fertility, is denied to it? These two influences prolonged frost and unseasonable drought must be adverse to the things that grow. The seasons seem to be all tumbled up together, and the fruits, which were once by formed by gentle showers, cannot be looked for from the uh, parched earth. But as last year was one that boasted of an exceedingly abundant harvest, okay, that is really interesting too. The Lord sent a huge harvest right before this happened. You are to collect all of its fruits that you can and store them up for the upcoming months of scarcity for which it is well able to provide and that ye may not be too much distressed by the signs of the heavens of which I have spoken. Return to the consideration of nature and apprehend the reason of that which makes the vulgar gape with wonder. The middle air is thickened by the rigor of snow and anyway, he goes on. Anyway, I do think that's interesting that the Lord sent a, an abundance before. So, and this one, this one is of note because this comes up in the prophecy and revelations about stars. Okay. So in China, it was noted, the star, quote, direct quote, the stars were lost from view for three months. And, unquote. Records indicate that the light from the sun dimmed, the expected rains did not um, eventually, the snow was seen in the middle of summer, famine was widespread, and in the midst of the turmoil, the emperor abandoned the capital. So I want you to note that's twice now that a leader of its people has has gone away. So like first the Mongols, he killed himself over all of this happening. And here in China, the emperor actually abandoned the people um, while this was happening. And I actually talked about some different comments that actually came through as well that were kind of freaking the people out too. Okay, now this one is super interesting. This is from a guy named Zachariah of Middle Team, Middling, and he seems to be a Jewish man. Because then I was like, okay, when did Passover happen that year, right? Because this is happening end of March. That's like, pay attention, red flags all over it. Um, and it did. You guys, it happened over the Passover week like the week before passover during the the jewish new year time period at least the spring new year on the first sabbath which is the sabbath before the feast of the unleavened bread the heavens above us were covered with stormy clouds brought by the east winds and instead of the usual rain a moistening water dropping upon the earth a powder composed of ashes and dust by the commandment of god and it showed itself upon stones and fell upon walls. And discerning men were in fear and trepidation and anxiety. And instead of the joy of Passover, they were in sorrow. So there it is right there that, yes, this event happened over Passover. At least that's when. And I think that's really interesting that the ashes and um, that covered up the sun when it reached the Jewish people was literally their week of Passover. Like, that's crazy, you guys. That, like, that's timing. Have I ever heard of divine timing there? So as you can see, those things were happening. And here's what the scripture prophesied about in Revelation. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth sack cloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So we know the moon becomes blood is when there's a solar eclipse or like the, the light of the sun is not hitting the moon and you get that like brownish red look of a moon, which is what multiple people, people had described is that the light had disappeared from the moon. You could still see it up there, but it didn't have its brightness anymore. And the stars of heaven fell from the earth Again, what the Chinese said, they couldn't even see the stars for three months. They were just gone. 
Um, even as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as the scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Um, which is really interesting. It does make me wonder, like, if new islands were formed or things moved around, because multiple people talked about the quaking that was constantly happening. And, I mean, we're seeing right now, we're living in a time of great earthquakes throughout the world, and they are very much coinciding with a lot of these volcanoes that go off in Indonesia. We've had a lot go off. Actually, a lot of volcanoes go off around the world here in just the past couple of years, coinciding with these earthquakes. Um, and one article I read, too, they said um, the, the big earthquake that went off in Indonesia in 536, there was also a huge earthquake, I think, in El Salvador in the exact same year that went off as well, that they think also contributed to this. So, like, you have multiple volcanic eruptions going on, which means you're going to have earthquakes also going on throughout the Earth. So, that's there. Um, and here's interesting. Here's about leaders of the Earth. And the kings of the Earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondsman, and every freeman, hid themselves in their dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So anyway, I, oh man, that was just crazy to me to see that like this prophecy was fulfilled like exactly to the letter, everything it's talking about um, coincides with this thing that happened, um, 536, that brought in the dark ages, that brought in the great apostasy, that that great apostasy and that terrible year without a winter where the sun was blocked for literally 18 months, like that's happened. It's, it's all there and it's in the, the records of the peoples of the earth. It's there. And I always wonder, like, why don't we learn this stuff in school? <laughs> we learn about all these that, like, I remember learning about the plague. I remember learning about how um, Muhammad and Islam rose. I remember hearing something about Anglo-Saxons, but, like, I never heard it connected all to another and how, um, how the religious people of the earth understood that, you know? And in fact, there was one quote in here, I think I didn't read it, but it's on one of these yellow things, where they noted that the sun was blocked, blocked off and it literally looked like sack, like sackcloth. So they were, they were definitely like um, relating it to these apocalyptic scriptures and these scriptures in Revelation, like they knew those enough to be like terrified <laughs> of like like these were the judgments of God coming upon the earth. So anyway, they talked about how it completely changed um, uh, like the countries of the earth and who was in charge and what people had great power. Um, in fact, it talks about the great power got switched from the European peoples um, to the Islamic people because that, well, that religion rose up. But it was that group of people that thought, like, the time when they took power. Um, and they can, like, they flourished during that time. Whereas uh, Europe went into a dark ages time period. So, anyway, thought it was really interesting. I had no idea about any of that. And, um, just thought it was fascinating. I think it's really cool when we can see that scriptures have been fulfilled and prophecy has been fulfilled and just like mind blowing that prophecy is made. And then it also makes me think, I know we talked about before, um, a couple of years ago, probably, and maybe it was in the 11th hour group about how, um, it was coming up for a lot of people like that about the volcano in Indonesia and how, um, it blocked out the light of the sun and it caused all these other things and, and wondering, is that going to happen again? Is that fulfill some of the prophecies about before the coming of the sun? Like, um, read it. Cause I've, I've read a lot lately in the scriptures with, in revelations and in Daniel 
somewhere he says, like, the year that it come, the sun will be blocked out and the moon will be turned to blood. Like, you know, that prophecy is made again. And so it's interesting to see that prophecy made earlier and how that was fulfilled. And so if it was fulfilled through volcanic explosions, that might be something coming. And how did that affect people beforehand? What did the Lord do to prepare people before that? And he and I, it was interesting. They noted that the year before this hit, the fruits of the tree gave forth more abundantly than usual, so that they had stored up quite a bit. So anyway, um, yeah, I just the whole thing was so interesting. Just like the natural cause of events that that it was like a domino effect um, that brought brought forth major change in the world and I I don't know it's just really interesting like when the millennial time comes it will also be a major time of change in the world um, for the better but you know maybe there's some natural events that cause it to get there volcano went off in Indonesia in Joseph Smith's time when he was pretty young um is exactly 1,280 years from when this other volcano went off. So they're kind of like bookends, which was really interesting. Um, it's not. <laughs> like the scriptures talk about 1260, but I do think it's really interesting because there's a type there in, in showing that the apostasy, where the woman like ran into the wilderness and was hidden for time, time, and a time and a half, and then it actually specifies 1260 at some parts, that there was like 1260 years from the apostasy, like when it like when it really began to when the restoration started again. Like so it's really interesting to see how this these events coincide with that and that these events did thrust the world into officially into the dark ages and how um, 1260 years later the first vision started bringing it out of the dark ages it's really uh, you guys it's amazing so anyway it was Mount Timbara that went off in 1816 and that's what created the year without a win a summer in Vermont. And um, there's tons of places in Vermont too, like if you look online that talk about how it caused total famine and crop failure and all that stuff. But it was in 536 AD that an Indonesian volcano called the Krakatoa volcano went off, blocking out the sun um, for a year. And um, so how it brought on the bubonic plague. So the bubonic plague was a virus found in Africa. Um, But Africa was so hot that the plague wasn't a problem because it like would kill off the plague, right? So it kept it in check, kind of like in the heat of summer, um, the the coronavirus isn't as big a deal, right? But when that volcano went off and it blocked out the sun for so long, it plummeted ten- temperatures all over the place. Um, and they had, in fact, they call it their year without the summer as well. And including Africa, Africa actually got much colder than it usually is. And because of that, the plague, the bubonic plague, um, started to thrive there instead of be killed off. And then, um, uh, ivory from elephants was a big trade item then, and they showed the route where, um, you know, it was picked up from Africa and then taken up the trade route um, up to, um, was it Alexandria or Constantinople? Anyway, and then how it got brought into rest of Europe, and it just basically spread from Africa. Um, so that one catastrophe brought on the bubonic plague and then when it hit the capital of the roman empire they were burying they said up to fifteen thousand people a day a day they were trying to bury people and they were trying to figure out where to put these bodies and they were they were taking them out to sea and dumping them in a location they were putting them inside the castle walls and they were they were um digging up um fruit orchards and burying them there and they were just like trying to keep up with burying everybody 
And when the city reached 250,000 people that had died from the plague, they just stopped counting. They are like, I don't even know. And then tons of people, of course, were like fleeing the city because it had become plagued and everybody was dying. Well, they ended up taking the plague with them and spreading it. And so then, you know, then it went off and just started spreading throughout the world. So anyway, so it brought on the plague and then ended up uh, when it hit like Asia and it hit the Mongol people of like the Mongolia area. Um, no, 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 scratch that. It was not the plague that hit them. So when the sun blocked out everything, ended up killing off a lot of grassland. And the Mongols had like the best understanding of horses and they like their lives revolved around their horses and um, they were the most well-trained horsemen in all the world. So anyway, when it killed off their grasslands and their horses didn't have anywhere to eat anymore, it killed, like, tons of their people, too. So tons of their people were dying, and then they also got massacred by the Turks, something, you know, something like that. But, um, and basically their leader ended up killing himself because of this great destruction that had come among his people, and felt responsible and all that stuff. Anyway, the people ended up leaving their homeland and migrating west 4,000 miles over to modern-day Hungary, and they arrived in Europe, and then pretty soon, within like a dozen years, they were taking over all these areas in Europe. And, in fact, their DNA can even be found today in modern Europeans. Like, it still shows up. So anyway, they get to Europe. The, the, the Roman Empire has been weakened by the plague. And then here come the Mongols, and they see their opportunity, and they start attacking the Roman, the Roman Empire as well. So anyway, it kind of brought down the fall of the Roman Empire. And you know, it like, took a little bit of time, but it, that's what took it down. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And that was a huge change in the world, because the Roman Empire had been the top power for 800 years and now suddenly like this act of god of blocking out the sun and bringing on a plague and bringing these crazy horsemen warriors from the east you know that had never been a problem before was suddenly taking them down so everybody saw it as an act of god and then and then and then so the plague then reached when it reached great britain the Celtic people, um, oh, this was really interesting. So, like, I, you always pay attention to the Celtic people in the Welsh area because they were just special. And they had, um, that area was really special for harboring lots of God's people, lots of the very royal blood of Israel, the reigning blood of Israel. Um, it's where that Niles from the, of the nine hostages, that's where he was from, and it's where King Arthur was, and it just, I, that that's where the 5,000 people joined the church, very first thing when the missionaries went there, like, big time royal blood of Israel was there, and the very last remnants of Christ's church and priesthood were were probably in that area last before it got wiped out completely. So when it reached Britain, which was in the 540s, this is interesting too. So this volcano went off in 536 AD. King Arthur, who was said to be a protector of the Holy Grail, which is this, which is, which is um, code for the Holy Bloodlines, King Arthur died in 537. So that volcano went off 536, and King Arthur died 537. And St. Patrick, the Catholics, they'd already taken over all of Ireland, um, and the ruling kings of Ireland with Niles of the King, like that had already happened um, about 50 years beforehand. So I can only imagine that, I mean, all the Druids had been wiped out. They seemed to be the closest people that had the priesthood that match for people that would have had a priesthood. So anyway, you can just see like apostasy has happened and just like the huge destructions are coming that like completely ushered the world into the dark ages, like literal dark ages. And one of the things I thought was interesting as it was 
so anyway, when it, sorry, let me finish about England. So when the plague hit England, um, it weakened the Celtic people even further. And at that point they could not withstand, um, the Anglo-Saxons that were starting to come up and that that's when the Anglo-Saxons took over power and um, united the eastern and western parts and you got England from the Angles so anyway so the whole world like shifted um, who was in power and all these different things and um, from all that as well um, it caused like these huge, I don't know if it's tidal waves or whatever to hit Yemen. And, um, the people of Yemen ended up having to flee that area and they fled northward. And one of those families that fled northward, um, their son in about 570 AD, I think he was born. Um, they had a son and he was Muhammad and he ended up starting the Islamic religion, which a lot of the world was ready for because they were searching for something at this point because of this crazy catastrophe they had just been through everywhere. And so a lot of people like clung to that, that, um, his teachings when he started teaching. So anyway, it just blew my mind how much the order of what happened, how it all happened in sequence with this volcano. We know that the Lord has used the volcano before, to um, enact his purposes. Um, anyway, it was just fascinating, you guys. I was just like, oh my goodness, like I didn't know this is when everything lined up for those things happening. And the beginning of the video was so interesting because they said, um, they like showed this volcano going off and the ash burning everywhere. And it said, it said, as the light of the sun was completely blocked out, darkness filled the earth. And it was so, so symbolic, you know, like the sun represents literally the son of God. The scriptures talk about that. I think I just shared that in here. And as his light was blocked out from apostasy, literally spiritual darkness was filling the earth at the same time, like because the apostasy was happening the great apostasy. So anyway, you guys, I was just blown away, blown away. Just like how much, what was happening in the physical world mirrored what was happening in the spiritual world at the time. And that it all just boom, 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 one right after another. Um, thought it was really fascinating. So then I was thinking about this and I was like, this wasn't there like, a prophecy about an earthquake in the sixth seal or something. I remember that coming up before, like, well, well, where's that huge earthquake? People have talked about that. Well, when you go to, so I had to go look up Revelations where it talks about that. So listen to this and how much what it talks about was fulfilled with this event and all the aftermath of the event. Oh, so what I didn't read to you is some of these accounts that, um, I've included here. These are ancient accounts of what people said happened. Um, so here's one. It says, um, and this is like a summary, this part. He said, the sun, the sun ceased to shine for a whole year, um, and the climate was beyond dire for the next 10 years. And as if that wasn't enough, this was then followed by a 50-year plague that swept back and forth across the world um, decimating the world population in mass places such as Constantinople were throwing out 5,000 to 10,000 bodies a day and are said to have given up counting when they reached um, a quarter of a million. The social, social consequences of this were unimaginable. The virtuous shared their food with their neighbor and both starved while the ruthless and aggressive hoarded and and pillaged them and took control. Society reached its lowest ebb. Um, the people were weak with famine and cold, and such a year of darkness, a decade of poor climate, and a 50-year plague destroyed the whole fabric of society. So that's kind of a summary. So then they put quotes from actual historical documents of the time. So here's one from Syria. The sun became dark, and its darkness lasted for 18 months. 
each day it shone for about four hours, and still this light was only a feeble shadow. The fruits did not ripen, and the vine tasted like sour grapes. Here's another one, Zechariah from somewhere I don't know. <laughs> and the earth with all that was upon it quaked, and the sun began to be darkened by day and the moon by night. And while the ocean was tumultuous with spray from the 24th of March, this okay, you guys, little history lesson. <laughs> um, this is something that I came across tonight and I was studying, or I should say earlier this morning. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because it's prophecy fulfilled. It's prophecy fulfilled about things that happened that were to happen under the sixth seal that was going on. And um, I had no idea about any of it. So I, maybe you guys didn't either. Maybe you did. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share here because I thought it was pretty interesting. So I keep seeing a like a history video pop up on YouTube, like suggested for me over the past couple of weeks. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I should watch that sometime because it's kind of interesting looking. And it was called um, 536 AD, the year that the sun disappeared. Um, so I kept being like, oh, that looks really interesting. Let me tuck that away for later. It came out four weeks ago on YouTube. But anyway, I kept seeing it um, when I was studying today. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I had to watch that. And I'm like, oh, but it's 50 minutes long. Like, I don't, I don't have time for that. <laughs> so anyway, but then... This other video came up, and it was called Why 536 AD Was the Worst Year to Be Alive. And that one finally got me for some reason. I was like, okay, I'll give, I'll watch. And it was really fascinating. So I'll have to go back and watch the other one, too. It's probably similar information. But basically, it was about how this um, huge volcano in Indonesia in the year 536 AD um, erupted and it was like it was so much bigger than even that one that went off that caused the the year without a summer for like Vermont and caused Joseph Smith's father to bring the family to Palmyra like drove them westward you know it was even bigger than that one and it was this huge explosion they go through in the documentary showing like how they've studied out how far um, the ashes from that explosion spread to other places, to other islands, and they were able to see how big the explosion was from it. And then they created a computer-generated explosion, like what it would have looked like. And it was basically like nuclear warheads going off. Um, and the ash from it like completely blocked out the sun to the extent that many records in the world note that the sun was blocked for a full year, which is insane. And I've included some of those records and those accounts here. They're the ones like with a yellow background of different places around the world, like them recording in, in there. Um, how it's so weird, like that the sun was just this dim bluish hue and that the moon, it even talks about how the moon, you could see the sphere of the moon, but it didn't give its brightness like it used to. And everybody was noting how strange this was. Well, it was so fascinating because it went on to talk about how because of that one incident, it ended up changing the entire world. And it took about 100 to 150 years to like completely flip the world and set it into a new chapter, really. But, um, but right away, the consequences were immediate. And um, because of all these major catastrophes that were all coming one after another, um, people were people thought it was the end of the world. They started writing very like apocalyptic type writings and stuff because they were like, "Oh my goodness, like the world is ending." And people, you know, were convinced these were the judgments of God. Um, and you'll see that in some of those writings too if you go and read them. So anyway, I did think it was interesting some of the, uh, oh, and I didn't put my notes. So let me go grab my notes really quick because um, it's easier to see on here. But basically, because of that one volcanic eruption over in Indonesia, 
Um, and it was, sounded like it wasn't the cr- the Kraken, but it was pretty close. <laughs> the name of that volcano, it was crazy close to the word Kraken. Anyway, because of that one explosion, it caused the bubonic plague. It caused the Mongol the the Mongolians um, to come west into Europe and start attacking Europe. Um, like like Attila the Hun, like all that stuff, you know. And it caused um, it, it caused the takedown of the Celtic people, which I think is very significant, knowing who the Celtic people were. Um, and it basically thrust uh, all of Europe into what we know as the Dark Ages. So, oh my goodness, you guys, it was like so so catastrophic. Um, the effects of it and just how it completely changed the world powers. Okay, so this is the first seven, six verses of Revelation chapter 8. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came. Okay, I also want to say that all over the New Testament and the Doctrine and Covenants, and probably other places, it calls the trumpets Trump. <laughs> and it is always talking about the second coming, or the last days, right? These plagues. Um, and there have been so many times where I'm like, there's no way that Trump is not a play on words, that Donald Trump is not a play on words here, because there's so many instances that fit within the four years that he was the president, things that occurred, (laughs) where I'm like, oh my gosh, even that he's so loud and obnoxious, and one of them is like, and the trump of the Lord blew loud and long, and I'm like, that is Donald Trump if I ever heard Donald Trump. He's loud and long. So anyway... Um, That was a side note. But anyway, so here in chapter 8, it says, And another angel, so you have the seven angels with the trumpets, and then you have another angel, who I believe is President Nelson, okay? Who came to be the president of the church as we came close to an ending of the silence, of the time of silence, okay? So if that ended... Let's just say 2021, the beginning of 2021. Um, he became the prophet in January of 2018, so three years before. So, anyway, another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was much, there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So the golden censer and the incense are the prayers. The smoke that goes up from the incense ascends to heaven and it is representative of the prayers of the people. So if you remember, in April of 2020, which I consider to be a monumental general conference, um, that was the first one right after the world shut down with COVID, there was that solemn assembly and the Hosanna shout. And what did President Nelson ask us to do? Twice In a two-week period of time, he asked us all to fast and pray for the end of COVID, right? So he asked us all to fast and pray, which we did. And then at General Conference, we did the Hosanna Shout. Between that and then he called for a fast, a worldwide fast, where, do you remember how fast that page went up on Facebook and got hundreds of thousands of people within one week that joined us in the fast on Good Friday and from all different faiths, right? So all of these faithful people from around the world heard, it's going to make me cry, sorry, heard the call of the prophet of God to fast and pray, to come together and fast and pray. And that is the incense. That is the smoke that ascended up from the incense, okay? So then this angel and smoke the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended over God out of the angel's hand. OK, 
Hey, I believe that angel is President Nelson. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So, since that time, and even before that time, since the last um, eclipse, like immediately after that eclipse in August of 2017, immediately the earth has been on fire. So, that's when the Amazon was on fire. That's when Paradise, California burned down and all of those millions of acres in California and Oregon and Washington and Montana and, I mean, not to mention a lot in Utah. Um, but there were fires everywhere, all over the earth. A ton of Africa was on fire. I remember looking at a satellite image at all of the fire that was happening and I was freaking out. So that was before this, okay? That was in 2017. And then right after those fires came the biggest um, hurricanes. So I think as Beth and I were talking, I really came to wonder, that first eclipse was on President Monson's last birthday. And I feel like it marked the end of a period and the beginning of a new period. And then... President Nelson became the prophet. And I feel like that was kind of the opening up, the leading into the seventh seal being opened. Um, and I felt like this earthquake was, was in fact significant. Although there are earthquakes every day, I had been looking for, not looking for, because I'm not a sign seeker. I'm a watcher, okay? I watch for the signs and I get really excited when I recognize the fulfillment. But I will tell you, the day, that miniature earthquake <laughs> that happened in Utah, and I know it was significant for some people, including both two people that I work with who were like three miles from the epicenter. It was really big for them. Um, it was big for um, one of my patients who has a business in Magna where the epicenter was. And it really caused a lot of damage, okay? But it wasn't a huge earthquake. The reason I think that earthquake is significant is because Angel Moroni dropped his trumpet. It did not shake off. It fell out, okay? It didn't break off is what I meant to say. It fell out. So I felt like that was a sign of the time of the Gentiles coming to an end. Not that it ended right then but that it was coming to an end. There was a time in the Doctrine and Covenants, and this was probably a rehearsal, but um, it talks about the elders coming home. And within three days, I believe, of that earthquake, which happened four days after the world shut down, within three days, the vast majority of missionaries throughout the world had been taken home to their homeland. Um, and I know not all of them did. My boss's daughter was in, where was she, Estonia, maybe? She did not get sent home. Nevertheless, the vast majority of the missionaries throughout the world were home within three days, which I love seeing the swift and capable movement of the church. I was amazed. So the recording cuts out right here, and I cannot find what happened to the rest of the conversation. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to read these two screenshots that this friend of mine shared. She said, um, she wrote, this is what I just wrote in my scriptures next to cast out devils in verse 19. These were some notes she made with the recent general conference. She says, I'm dying right now reading through this chapter today. There's so much here. I see the notes I've been making in this chapter over the last couple of years. I'm seeing this stuff unfold right before my eyes. As I'm reading, I'm recognizing over and over how President Nelson is surely a type of Nephi. That talk I just mentioned where he gives the five steps, it's on spiritual momentum. He literally tells us to cast out the devil. I've never heard that said in a conference talk before. This cannot be a coincidence. I feel like we are flying through our type of third Nephi seven right now. 
which is only two chapters and a couple of years before the massive destruction that happens three days before the Savior comes to them. I've been discussing this with friends. We've been studying the signs of the times for the last several years together, sharing notes, insights, and fantastic discussion. It seems to several of us that 2024, in alignment with the second total solar eclipse over our nation on April 8, 2024, is extremely significant in the timeline of things. So she talks about how, you know, possibly it could be a sign of deliverance. Um, she said it happens on the same day on the Jewish calendar that the Hebrews received a major sign in the heavens. That sounds like a solar eclipse that signaled to them that they would soon be released from the captivity of the Pharaoh. They were released, according to some historians, 10 days later after the Passover, which we happened to study in Come Follow Me last week. This is all blowing my mind right now. Um, anyways, that's all I have to share from those two friends. But I just wanted to say that when I was listening to this conversation a while ago, I recorded it so that I could later share it in a video. I had their permission to share it. And we weren't even thinking about the things that would take place this month. Um, this past weekend, we had the blood red moon. We had the total lunar eclipse. And... I wasn't even thinking about that being just right around the corner. We weren't even talking about that. So it was very fascinating to me that just last month we had had this conversation about these signs and um, events that have happened throughout history that have really assisted in the gathering of Israel. Um, just how amazing the Lord is, how he's always in the details, and how President Nelson has been so optimistic and just really repeating that message of that importance of participating in this work of gathering Israel, how everybody plays a role, and, and this work is what can bring us our greatest joy. So just, you know, having reflected on all of that over the last 30 days or so has just been amazing and just a lot of food for thought. The next total lunar eclipse will be November 8th of this year. So that's something to mark on your calendar. It'll be visible again from North America. But I just wanted to share my thoughts about yesterday, about the blood red moon and everything that happened um, on Sunday. I wrote this post and I wrote May 15th, 2022, the anniversary of the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood to the earth, a blood moon, and a prophet and his wife deliver a powerful message to generations Y and Z about their divine identity. In the Hebrew language, the word coincidence does not exist because it's believed that God is always in the details. The word used instead is miracle. God was in the details tonight for sure. I don't believe it was a coincidence that three significant events happened today, pointing us heavenward. This blood moon, known as the flower moon, was said by the media to be a primetime affair for the mountain time zone, where President Nelson spoke from. To me, this eclipse was symbolic. Throughout history, eclipses have been seen as a harbinger of change. Flowers represent fragility and the swift passage from life into death. Tonight, President Nelson reminded millennials and Generation Z, Zion, that this life is a nanosecond of eternity. Now is the time to know who we are and why we are here and make it count. He said to avoid labeling ourselves as anything other than a child of God, child of the covenant, and disciple of Christ, because stereotypes divide and can potentially thwart our eternal progression. Our identity doesn't lie in cultural labels. It lies in the truth that we are God's children. This short life is the time to prepare to meet him. Sister Nelson reminded everyone to seek to be holy. This echoed our Sunday school lesson today as we studied Numbers 21. Look to God and live. Tonight there were many reminders pointing us heavenward, reminding us to look to God and live. Here's the pictures that I shared to go along with that. And I just want to say it was an amazing night. It was a surreal experience to see that moon with my kids, and I think it's something they're always going to remember. But I'm going to share more about this in my next video, and I also wanted to say that, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of interesting things have happened in the last 24 hours. 
I feel like today there were a lot of crazy incidents that happened to members of my family, friends, people that I know. And the theme that they all had in common was either a brush with death or some kind of a close call um, that really got them to pay attention and got them to settle down, relax, rest, and ponder. So some really big things have happened, and it's just been one after another, and um, it doesn't seem like a coincidence. Anyways, especially after what I, I shared about coincidences. <laughs> but um, I'm going to ponder on that more and share in the next Happy Lady video message. So I'd love to hear any thoughts and experiences that you've had, so feel free to reach out to me, and I hope you have a great week.